the devil too long. We're going to take the devil's king. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You're armed and you're dangerous if you're a child of God with His Word in your heart. Hallelujah. See, I've got the helmet of salvation on this morning. I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. The devil tells me I'm not, and that makes me shout because he's a liar. Amen. My heart is covered with the breastplate of righteousness. I've been to Calvary's cross, and I don't walk in my own righteousness, but I'm covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ through his finished work and his shed blood. My loins are girt about with truth. And that holds everything together. Truth, hallelujah. Doesn't, you can't just be sincere. You might be sincerely wrong, but Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Without the belt of truth, you've got nothing to hang your sword on. Amen. Amen. My feet are shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I'm ready to stand, and when I've done all I can do to stand, I'm just going to stand anyway. I'm raising the shield of faith this morning because the fiery darts of the evil one are directed at me and directed at you. Hallelujah. But I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And you better look out, devil, because I'm pulling out the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of joints and marrow. Hallelujah. And is a dis and soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. So tell the person next to you, put your armor on. There's a battle to win. Hallelujah. Even as Josiah tore down every altar in every high place this morning, we are victorious in Jesus' name. 
You gotta be strong. We gotta be bold. We're gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. <laughs> We're gonna reclaim every child, every lost young person that's gone away. We're claiming them in Jesus' name. If you're here this morning and your heart's full of doubt, God's going to arrest you by the power of His Spirit. We're going to reclaim everything the devil has stole in our high schools and our colleges and middle school. We're going to tear the devil's kingdom down. Come on now. Let's go up. Going up to the high places. Going up. Going up. hurt anybody's feelings or ears but I'd like the music to come up just another level where I can hear that guitar Amen. was that gonna bother anybody if it is buy you some earplugs and we'll be all right okay hallelujah we gotta be strong yes. we gotta be bold yes. we're gonna tear the yes. devil's kingdom down Come on, Stephen. We're gonna reclaim everything the devil has stole. We're gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. Sing it with all your heart. Going up to the high places. Let's go up. Going up to the high places. Let's go up. Going up to the high places. Jesus, amen. Breaking every chain, hallelujah. Let's stand in faith, hallelujah, for ones who are addicted, not just drug addictions, substance addictions, not this, those just that those addictions, addictions, but mental. We've allowed the enemy just to come in and take over our thought life, and we yield it to it. Unforgiveness, bitterness, all kind of stuff going on in the house of God, and it shouldn't be. Let's break those chains and replace it. With the love of God, amen, in Jesus' name.
It's called Jehovah, and it was about, um, I wrote it about the people who were standing at the walls of Jericho um, and how that applies to um, how we fight today. I have a simple subject this morning. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 21. And Jesus says, follow me. <laughs> we'll sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. And we talk about following him, but uh, sometimes we want to follow him along the shores of Galilee and hear him teach, and we want to follow him to where he heals the sick and multiplies the loaves and the fishes, meets the needs of the people. But if you're going to really follow him, he said this, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Are you willing to follow him to Gethsemane? Are you willing to follow him to the whipping post? Are you willing to follow him to Pilate's Hall? Are you willing to follow him to Calvary? And, be, and say with the Apostle Paul, I am crucified with Christ, yet I live. But not I, it's Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the power of the Son of God, the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Our culture has become so self-centered and so entertainment-minded that church has become another entertainment venue. And we shop from church to church to see which entertains us the most. I don't need to be entertained this morning. I need to be committed to following Christ. And, and believe it or not, if you study the Scriptures, you're no more committed to Christ than you are His body, His people. Amen? Oh, I want to serve God, but I just hate the church. Now, just walk up to Christ and say, I love you, Jesus, but I hate your bride. You think this was my idea, this church thing? No, upon this rock I will build my church. You know, you'd have no New Testament letters if it wasn't for local church. No missionaries would be sent. There'd be nowhere to put the five-fold ministry. The five-fold ministry was put in the church. So just in case you thought it was some preacher's idea, understand that this is what there'd be no... How about church discipline, huh? God is telling us we need the body of Christ. Are you still, are you still willing to follow Jesus? And, and, and as you know, John chapter 21 is dealing with Peter after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. This is within the 40-day period when Christ is, is appearing and speaking to so many and showing Himself alive to over 500 at once. And you say, well, Pastor, you really believe that? Absolutely. These, these people gave their lives after seeing the risen Christ. If they'd have made it up, they wouldn't have given their lives for it, would they? And, and I thought about how that as I look at John 21, it's reminiscent of Luke chapter 5 when Peter first meets the Lord and Jesus comes upon uh, the lake and gets ready to preach and the crowd presses in against him and Jesus turns to Peter and asks to borrow the boat and he gets into the boat and just sets out a little bit from the land so he can speak and the water will amplify his voice to the crowds gathered there and the crowds can't press in upon him uh, and crush him to where he can't even uh, speak to all of them and he begins to teach and preach and Peter's wore out. He's been up all night long fishing. And now here's this rabbi from Galilee <laughs> keeping him there to listen to a sermon. And then when the sermon is over, Jesus says to Peter, Now let's cast out your nets for a catch. Go out into the deep. And, and Peter's like, I've toiled all night. I know more about fishing, you know. And I'm paraphrasing. Now you're a carpenter, okay? I'm a fisherman. He didn't realize who he was at that point. And Jesus said, just, but Peter says, nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the net. And, and, and he does, and, and, and there's such an abundance of fish that, that they can hardly deal with the catch. And, and Peter does something that, that to me is just like I'd probably do. I mean, get this, he's a roughneck cussing fisherman, uh, uh, not really well educated, and he doesn't expect this rabbi to select him as a disciple, and he gets down before him and he says, Depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Ever feel that way? Lord, go get somebody else. I'm just not worthy. But you know what? Jesus has put his hand on you in spite of yourself. In spite of your failings and your sins and the, and the mistakes that you've made, he knew that you were going to make those mistakes before you were born. He does not love you any less. He still has purpose for you. He still has a plan for you. He's got a reason for you being here this morning. He, you, he brought you here this morning to hear this word that he still has a call and a touch on your life. Peter will spend the next three and a half years following Jesus. Sometimes saying the right thing and sometimes saying the wrong thing. Sometimes saying the wrong thing at exactly the right moment. <laughs> and Jesus never kicks him out. Aren't you glad? I mean, it blows my mind that on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he's selected to come up with just two others and witness Jesus being transfigured in his raiment as white as snow and he's so white, brilliant light shining out of him because he is the light of the world. Somebody said, oh, was that a miracle for Jesus to be? No, no, the miracle was that he could take all that glory and wrap it up and look like a normal human. Just a little bit of who he was was shining through. 
And the law and the prophets appeared with him, Moses and Elijah, because he was about to fulfill it all on the cross. And Peter's like, well, let's build three tabernacles, one for Jesus and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And the Lord says from heaven, this is my son, hear him. How may I understand good people can sometimes say the wrong thing at the right time? So Peter goes on to not always get it right, but every now and then the Holy Ghost just gives him revelation. <laughs> I love it when Jesus says, Who do men say that I am? Oh, some say you're John the Baptist risen from the dead. Some say you're Jeremiah or, or, or Elijah, one of the prophets, and he looks at him, Who do you say that I am? That's an important question. No question more important than that. Amen. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. I'm giving you kingdom authority because you know who I am. Your authority, your keys is knowing that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords and there's none like Him. Amen. So he says right things and he says wrong things. He has little uh, disagreements with other disciples. Can you imagine putting a tax collector, a scholar, fishermen, uh, farmers, zealots, just put them all together in one mix and let them travel together all the time. I can see Jesus sometimes saying, don't make me stop this camel. <laughs> huh? So, oh, pastor, didn't they just walk around with halos and get along? Let me tell you something. Only thing... Only thing righteous and holy and super about any saint in the Bible is his connection or her connection with Jesus Christ. They're all just as human as you and I are. And one of them had really gotten on Peter's nerves at least for the seventh time that day. I know that. Well, how do you know? Because he says to Jesus, how many times did you say I had to forgive my brother in one day? Oh, you've never felt that way. You know the answer. Seventy times seven. Can you see him? And so, he follows Jesus, but he's not perfect. He walks with him. He talks with him. He hears his voice. And you know what? The key is not his perfection. The key is he loves Jesus. Nobody has... I mean, Jesus has transformed his life and through him, he's going to change the world. He's going to transform the world. And, and, and so, even though he's imperfect, he keeps on following. Can I, can I advise you this morning, whatever mistakes you might have made this week, don't ever quit following Jesus. Whatever stumbling you might have had, don't ever quit following Jesus. Stay close to him. Don't let the devil tell you, well, now, he's done with you. They wind up in the upper room. And they're having a discussion about who's going to be the greatest. You know the story. Because whoever was the servant should have been at the door washing the stuff off their feet. Now, I mean it too. They didn't come together with clean, perfumed feet and go through a ceremony here. They'd been walking through Jerusalem where people were leading sacrificial animals to the temple and riding donkeys and horses, and they were wearing sandals. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and Jesus takes off his rabbi's robe and his tallit, and he girds himself with a towel like a slave, and he washes their dirty feet including Peter. And these feet are going to run away from him in just a few hours. Including Judas, whose feet would carry him to the high priest to betray him. And Jesus says, one of you, he says, if I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. You need to be servants to each other and the night goes on and Jesus says, one of you will betray me tonight. Oh no! Is it I? Is it I? And Peter go, starts bragging. How many ever bragged on how good you're going to do? And then messed up worse than ever. Anybody beside me? I have. 
Lord, I'll never betray you. I won't deny you. I'll go with you to death. You know, I don't know what about the rest of these guys, but you can count on me, Lord. And Jesus turns to him and says, Peter, before the rooster crows three times tomorrow morning, you're going to deny that you even know me. Oh, not me. I want you to notice what Jesus said to him. But I have prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail. And the King James says it this way, and when thou art converted. <laughs> you don't get real conversion until the blood is shed and the Holy Spirit comes. Amen. When thou art converted, strengthen your brethren. Lord, I won't deny you. Most of you know the story, but I just want to touch on a few points. Peter's full intention was to be faithful to Jesus till the end. His heart, Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But, but there began to be a digression. He's struggling in his mind now. Jesus has, has said, you're going to deny me, but you're going to get straightened out. He prayed that his faith wouldn't fail. Aren't you glad that if you've got the faith to believe, he can forgive you? He could have forgiven Judas if Judas's faith hadn't failed. Don't you believe there's that much power in his blood? And so... Peter travels with them down across the Kidron Valley. And Jesus begins to spend the night in prayer. And as he agonizes and weeps, he begins to sweat till it becomes like great drops of blood. And Father, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. The disciples are bewildered. They're perplexed. It's been a busy week from the triumphal entry into Jerusalem to the rejection by the elders and leaders, to him casting out the money changers. They're so tired. And even though they try to stay awake, they fall asleep. You see, Jesus went a little further. Peter and John, James a little closer, but yet he's still travailing in prayer on his own and he comes back and he wakes him up and said, can't you watch with me just one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Finally, lights are coming in the distance, the torches, the soldiers, the horses, Judas in the lead. Peter wakes up. How many know how confused you can be when you first wake up and you haven't had much rest? And all of a sudden... He sees the soldiers coming to arrest Jesus. And he said, you know, in his mind, I said I would fight. I said I'd defend him. I'm going to do it. And he pulls his sword. You see, he wasn't listening. He was sleeping when he should have been praying. So when the en enemy attacked, he becomes confused. He pulls that sword and Malchus, the high priest's servant, is there. And he slices off his ear and Jesus says to him, put away your sword. For those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And now he's confused. How many has ever done what you thought was the right thing? And the Holy Spirit would say, no, that's not how you should have handled that. And the confusion causes him to drop back. Jesus heals Malchus and the, they rush away with Christ and, and the disciples run and Jesus commanded that they release the disciples and Peter's in total confusion and, and he's like, I thought I was doing the right thing. I was trying to defend his honor. I was trying to keep him from being arrested and yet he rebukes me and now he's in confused. And some of you are right there this morning. You tried to do right and it just turned out wrong and you're confused. And the mistake that he makes in his confusion is he follows from a distance. When you follow from a distance, you're going to get with the wrong crowd. When you follow from a distance, you're out of fellowship with the body of Christ. Following from a distance will get you in trouble. Let's get as close to Jesus as we can. And from a distance... He finds himself in Caiaphas' courtyard. He's warming his hands by the devil's fire, if you will. Listening to the ridicule of those around. And some of you, even last night, some of the places you were, you heard ridicule about living right in Christ. And the language you used was to try to prove to them that you didn't know anything about this Jesus. 
because it just ain't cool at a party. Now, you know I'm being real. To honor Christ. So finally, you're one of them. You were with Him. No, I don't know Him. Yes, you are. You're a Galilean. Your speech betrays you. Let me tell you something. Once you've been with Jesus, the world knows you're different. You go try to act like Him if you want to. You're not going to fit in. Jesus has left His mark on you. No, I don't know Him. And then He curses and takes an oath, swears He doesn't know Jesus and, 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 and the doors open and, and Jesus is on trial and their eyes meet. The rooster crows and the Bible said He went and wept bitterly. Now I'm telling you, real repentance has some emotion to it. When you realize, I want you to hear me, somebody said this last night and it just stayed with me. To minimize sin and say it's not so bad is to minimize what he did on the cross. Peter was right in feeling anguish and conviction about denying the Lord. Because when you realize what a precious relationship you've had with Jesus and then you deny Him, there ought to be something in your heart that breaks when you realize what you've done. Amen. You need to know, even if you've never been saved, He loves you and He's calling you and your denial of Him, God wants your heart to be touched to where you realize, I could have a close fellowship and friendship with Jesus, but I've allowed my sin to separate me from Him. Amen. And He begins to weep and repent. And Jesus had said, I'm praying your faith don't fail. Because you've got to believe in His forgiveness. Amen. I, somebody here today, you're thinking, I don't know if He'll ever really forgive me. Let me tell you something. Your sin is not more powerful than His sacrifice on the cross. He didn't go to the cross so He could withhold forgiveness from you. Amen. And so, the night becomes so dark... You know the story that the day becomes dark, literally. The next morning, the earth shakes. The veil of the temple is ripped from top to bottom. Jesus says, Father, into thine hands I commend my spirit. And he passes away. Judas is confused. He throws the money at the feet of the high priest. I've sinned and betrayed innocent blood. Peter is in such depression. How could he have possibly fallen this low after walking with Jesus for three and a half years? He hears stories on the third day that Jesus is alive. (laughs) There's an interesting thing in Mark chapter 16 when they come to the tomb. And they find the tomb empty. There's a stranger in the tomb, robed in white. And the stranger says this, He's not here. He's risen. Why seek ye the living among the dead? (laughs) There was an old downtown church that had that on their marquee. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. (laughs) That's not really good. (laughs) And, And then he says this in Mark 16, The the angel says this, Go and tell his disciples and Peter. I want you to get that. Jesus says you need to tell Peter because Peter's so down on himself that he he won't think it's for him. Isn't that just like Jesus? To to reaffirm you in spite of what the enemy has done in your life? To tell you my call is still valid on your life? (laughs) Go tell my disciples and Peter. And I've risen. You all know how Peter and John ran to the tomb and, 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 and how he appeared, but yet Peter's still struggling. And we come to John 21. Now don't get worried because I just now got to my text. That don't mean I'm preaching another hour. In John 21, Peter decides that since he's messed up like he has, 
he's going to go back to his old occupation and back to the boats that he left. And he says, I'm going fishing. Now, you might have read that as just like, we're going fishing for fun, but no, no, no. Peter was saying, I'm going back to what I used to do because I've failed the Lord. And he thought he was going back to what he used to do, but he didn't know Jesus was bringing him back to the place where he first met him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A lot of times when you think the enemy's got you ensnared and taken you back to what you used to be and where you used to be. No, no, no. He's going to remind you of where you were when he first called you and he's going to reaffirm his commitment to you. Amen. <laughs> and so out there, they are fishing. They're not catching anything. And Peter's throwed off his outer garment and they hear a voice from the shore. Saying, you got any fish? <laughs> I just love it. Here's the risen, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ just hanging out with the guys again. Isn't He awesome? Aren't you glad He'll hang out with you? He's a, what an awesome Savior we serve. No, He have not caught anything. Well, cast your net on the other side. <laughs> Here's a reminder... Here's a reminder. I'm going to multiply your catch just like I did the first time we met. I'm going to remind you that I have not changed my mind about you. They haul in 153 fish. That's a pretty good catch, amen? I mean, it was so impressive that John wrote the number down. Had you ever tried to go back? Have you ever thought you could go back to the way it used to be? Guess what? Jesus is coming to where you are, even this morning. Hallelujah. And you know what? Jesus invites them to breakfast. Some say, well, when I get so high in the kingdom of God, people will serve me. I won't have to serve. Got news for you. Here's a resurrected Christ. What's he doing? Cooking breakfast for his disciples. Did you know when he comes again, he will again serve his people? What, is, what an awesome servant king we have. As they, you all know the old song, Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. Taken right out of this story. He's calling to you. And he calls to them and he's got fish and bread and breakfast ready for them. Tells them to bring a few that they've caught. He's going to throw those on the grill too. This is the risen Lord. This is... <laughs> and then he starts talking to Peter. I'm finally to the text. So when they'd eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah... Do you love me more than these, more than these boats and your old lifestyle and your occupation? And he said unto him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. And he said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, Then tend my sheep. And the third time he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Now I want to ask you something. When God asks the question, is it because he needs to know the answer? It's always so you will know the answer. Jesus already knew that Peter loved him. Jesus knew that someday Peter would give his life for him. But he wanted Peter to know. And the way that Peter realized how much he loved Jesus was by voicing it. You see, there's something about confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Whew, hallelujah. There's something about why do you praise? Why do you speak out loud how awesome is he, he is? Is he some egotistical God that needs to be told how awesome he is? No. You're some finite person that needs to speak about his awesomeness, to speak about his grace, to speak about his love, so faith will arise in your spirit. 
And Jesus knew that if He could get Peter to confess what he knew in his heart that Peter would be reaffirmed. Peter would be reestablished. So he said one time for each time that Peter denied him, Peter, do you love me? And the first two times, Jesus in the Greek uses the word agape. And Peter replies with phileo. Do you love me with a God kind of love? And Peter's not sure of himself. So he says, well... I'm your friend. I love you with brotherly love. (laughs) And the third time Jesus uses phileo, which is to say, Peter, I am still your friend. Isn't that beautiful? What a Savior. I want to tell you something. He'll come to where you are. And even somebody watching by TV, He's come to where you are this morning to say, I love you. And I know in your heart you love me. And I haven't canceled my plans for you. you, Guess who gets to preach the first message after the Holy Spirit descends and see 3,000 people come into the kingdom of God in, in just a few minutes? He loves you this morning. So, well, Lord, and Jesus says, you know how you're going to show me that you love me? You're going to be good to my people. You're going to understand that, well, you know, now I know, I struggle with this, that God is first, family second, ministry third. But there are times my family needs to see me sacrifice for my God. Amen. Ask David on the way back to Ziklag, had he not stopped in pursuit of his family to rescue his family, he stops to do, do kindness to an enemy that helped invade the village. And in his stopping, even in his grief, to minister to that hurting person. Isn't that incredible? Is the secret of his family being saved. Wow. If he'd have said, you know, and I, I would have probably done this, I'd have probably said, I ain't got time to fool with no Egyptian that was in on the raid. I'm done. I got a family to rescue. He'd have never found them. I know I'm on a different subject. I'm teaching on that this month over here at WVCU, so it sneaks in there. But, it, but Peter, if you really love me, you got to minister to my family, my body, the sheep, the lambs, those that are hurting, those that have needs. You can't love him without ministering to his people because you love him when you obey him. Peter's heart was... Touched when Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? But I want you to notice that there's a conclusion here. Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked wherever you wished. But when you're old, you're going to stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you don't wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this to him, he said to him, say it with me, follow me. Right back, the first thing he said. Isn't that awesome? He said, well, pastor, what is that? Is he saying that Peter's going to get so old and feeble that somebody else is going to have to clothe him and dress him and lead him around? No, Peter never did get old and feeble, never did get feeble like that. He was still, as far as I can tell, when he was crucified, he requested to be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to die as Christ. But you know who the another is that's going to lead you and clothe you and guide you and take you where you don't want to go? It's the Holy Ghost. You did it all your way. But when you get older, you're not going to do this your way. Somebody else is going to guide you. Somebody else is going to clothe you in righteousness. Somebody else is going to take you where you wouldn't want to go. You know why? Because you're going to follow me. Stand with me. The Holy Ghost is saying to somebody this morning, I haven't changed my mind about you. Follow me. If you turn now to 1 Peter chapter 5, listen to what the seasoned old veteran of the gospel who never ever again denied his Lord says. The elders who are among you I exhort, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And also, he didn't stop with just the sufferings, a partaker of the glory 
that will be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, or shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. See how this feed my sheep has reverberated in his spirit through the years, and he's passing it on before he leaves to those that are under him. But being examples to the flock, and when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive a crown of glory that doesn't fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit to your elders. All of you be submissive one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. Read this with me. Casting all your cares upon Him. For He cares for you. Jesus is saying this morning, do you love me? Be good to my people. Do what I've called you to do. But most of all, follow me. Because you can't follow me without being close to me. Don't follow from a distance this morning. Just come on up here if God's dealing with your heart. Some of you just need to reaffirm your commitment to the call. Because He's calling you to feed His sheep and to minister His grace to a lost and hurt and dying world.